in memory and in honor of Dr. Wally Shack of, of Ze'ev Wolf Ben Pinchas. That's a Hebrew name, right? So Ze'ev Wolf, the son of Pinchas, Allah Vashalom of blessed memory, and our, our words of Torah should serve Le'iloi Nishmato, to elevate, elevate his soul. Good. Natalie, this, that's Sasha I mentioned too. That's my wife, Natalie. <coughs> okay, so Parshat Vayeshev has a lot of things to discuss. Uh, once again, it's hard to decide what not to discuss as opposed to what we should discuss. Yaakov, Jacob has returned. So we're on page 198. Jacob has returned back home. Jacob has, his sons have all been born. Jacob has been through, he's been to hell and back, basically, right? Going, running for his life from Esav, the, the getting together again with Esav safe, safely, even though it was quite treacherous. All the time he spent, he spent in the house of Lavan. And, you know, the, being, be, being tricked in terms of the wives, in terms of the marriages. At this point, the Pasuk says, Vayeshev Yaakov. Let's start page 198. Okay. Vayeshev Yaakov be'eretz migore aviv, be'eretz knam. Ele toldot Yaakov, Yosef ben shva esre shana haya, roe et achiv betzon betzon, ve'unar et bnei bil'a, ve'et bnei zilpa, meshe aviv, ve'ebe Yosef et dibatam, ra'a al avihem. Beautiful. So take for us in English, please. Marta. Jacob settled in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the chronicles of Jacob. Joseph, at the age of 17, was a shepherd with his brothers by the flock. He was a youth with sons, with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpha. He and he, his, his, father. Father, his father's wives, and Joseph would bring evil reports about them to his father. Okay. So we have over here is famously... Jacob settled in the land of his father's sojournings. And Rashi brings the famous medrash of Bikesh Yaakov Leshev Bishalva. Yaakov wanted to retire. He wanted to, to, to settle peacefully. Right? He, wa he was ready for leisure world. That's what he wanted. He wanted to retire. He wanted Leshev Bishalva. He wanted to sit peacefully. And to which the heavenly response was, is it not enough for the righteous that the world to come is destined <coughs> for them? They also want to settle peacefully in this world, and therefore the whole episode of, Je of Yosef, of Joseph, now came jumping out at him. Now, what's wrong with retiring? Right? It's, it seems, right, and that if you look at the Pasuk, you, you, you hear it in the Pasuk, the Mabla points out, Vayeshev Yaakov Eretz Mugurei Aviv. Yaakov settled in the land of his father's sojournings. Sojournings means that there's a challenge, and you, and you carry on, and you overcome, and you, and you manage your way through, you navigate your way through. Vayeshev means he wanted to <laughs> He wanted to settle, right? So what's wrong? He put in a long, hard life. What's wrong with wanting to lay shave Bishalva, to sit peacefully? Linda? We're supposed to use every moment of our time. Okay, okay. So there is... Olam Hazed, this is the world of challenges. This is the world where we grow, where we develop, where we transcend, where we become greater than we were the moment before, the day before. The moda'ani lefanecha that we start the day with. We thank you, Sheikh Hazar to Binish Masibhemla, that you gave back my neshama, my soul, with your with your graciousness. Rabbah emunasecha. Great is 
the faithfulness, or really great is your faith, meaning God, great is your faith in me that you've given me another day. Right? It's not a given. It can't be taken for granted. Great is your faith in me that you have given me another day. And therefore, every day is meant to be productive. Every day is meant to be maximized. And Yaakov, on his madrega, on his level, Boker Tov Aaron, And it doesn't have to be a men's section. You can also sit over here. Okay. Right? So, um, it's Yaakov, on his madrega, on his level, felt that it's time to, uh, to rest up a bit. Time to, time to slow down just a bit. He wanted, there's a seat over here, Laura, if you like. Right? He wanted leshev v'shalva. He wanted to sit peacefully. How old right? is he now? How old is Yaakov now? Oh, well, <laughs> Yosef is Yosef is seventeen, okay, and he was sixty three, seventy seven, eighty four. Oh, a, a little over a hundred. Right, right, right around, right, right around, right around the hundred mark. Okay, we can understand, right. You know, but then again, people were, right, in biblical, uh, the, the people were living longer, right? But, um, yeah. So what happens over here? And, 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 and I want to I skim through, there's so much to talk about over here. I, I want to skim through to get to two episodes that, that occur later on in the power show. So we see right away that the causes of the jealousy that the brothers had for Joseph. Okay, he was 17 years old. He was shepherding his brothers with the sheep, right? Ro'et et echav betzon, right? So it seems that, right, he was really shepherding the brothers. He was watching everything that they would do. He was acting like a youth with the sons of Bil and Zilpah. Neshei aviv, the wives of his father, and Yosef would bring Diba Tamra, Joseph would bring any bad things that he saw about his brothers, he would bring El Avihem to their father. Okay, now it's interesting, before he said his father, now it's their father. So we know that one of the things that's mentioned that he would bring to the father, uh, tattling about the brothers, was that they were acting in a, uh, in a degrading manner to the brothers who were the sons not of Leah and Rachel, the main wives, but the, the children of Bila and Zilpah. So we see that Yosef viewed them as B'nai Bila and Zilpah, Neshei Aviv, as the wives of the father, right? Even though they're referred to as the Pilag Shim, the concubines, Right, they were. He viewed them as the wives of their of his father. So he felt that they shouldn't be degrading these boys. Yosef brought what was happening to their father. So I think the Rashbam was some explained their father, meaning the father of these sons of Bil and Zilpah, who were being treated in a dismissive fashion. They're your sons. They should be treated respectfully. But the brothers, right, here are a number of causes why the brothers had this animosity towards Joseph. The Yisrael Ahavet Yosef. And furthermore, Jacob, Yisrael, loved Joseph from all the children. He was born to him in his old age, and he made for him a special garment. The special garment was to show that he is like the leader. He is the main child. <laughs> this was a bad idea. And the Gemara says because of this small amount of silk that he gave to Joseph more than the brothers, that's what led to all that's going to be following. Rabbi, the, yes? The, uh, the English here says evil reports. Is what exactly the meaning in Hebrew here? 
Yeah, dibatam ra'a. Yes, dibatam are tidings or, 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 or sayings, things that they were doing, things that they were saying. So Joseph was bringing all this to their father. And then, of course, we're not going to get, we're not going to spend too much time on it, right? And then Joseph has his famous dreams, right? The dreams of the, the sheaves bowing down to him, and then the dream of the stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. These were dreams that Joseph thought, understood them to be prophecy dreams. And he uh, mistakenly thought that by sharing this with the brothers, they would realize that it's not just, you know, it's not him, but he, this is the position that the heavens are giving to him. The brothers, of course, felt differently, and they thought these dreams are his aspirations. This is his hopes. This is not heavenly. This is very, 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 very lowly, earthly, of, of his wish. And they were jealous. They despised him. And then the brothers go off on page 202-203. They go off to shepherd and Yisrael, the father, sends Yosef. Right? Now, you see, we keep referring to him as Yisrael over here. His name was changed from Yaakov to Yisrael. Nevertheless, these names are used somewhat interchangeably. But I believe the Orachayim explains, and we'll see uh, probably next week's parish, we'll see very, very clearly how when he is in, when Yaakov is in a state, an exalted state, a spiritual state, when the world is going well, he is Yisrael. When he is, he is Israel. When he is in a downtrodden state, when he is in a state of mourning after Joseph is gone, so then he is, he is referred to by the name of Jacob. And as we see very clearly, we'll see either next week or the week after, when he is reunited with Yosef, or when he hears about Yosef, the Pesach says, and Vayomer Yaakov, Yaakov said, Jacob said, oh, I'm sorry, and Jacob, Jacob said, oh, Yosef is still alive, and then the same verse says, and Yisrael got up, Vatichi Ruach, Vatichi Ruach Yaakov, Vayomer Yisrael. That's what Pazik says. The spirit of Yaakov came alive and Yisrael said, and Israel said. Once he saw that, that, that Joseph was alive, he resuscitated. Okay, so they send Joseph out there to, he sends Joseph there <coughs> to check on the brothers and the brothers decide to sell him. Okay? Obviously a very, very troubling, difficult parsha. The, the approach, yeah, I don't want to spend time on that this year. The approach that we have is the approach of the Sephorno, I think it is, who explains that there's a concept called a rodef. A rodef is someone who is pursuing you to try to kill you. The brothers viewed Yosef, Joseph, as a spiritual rodef. They looked at the family history and they said, okay, Avraham had an older son, Yishmael, and his younger son, Yitzchak, Isaac. Yishmael was rejected, and the lineage carried on through the younger son, Yitzchak. Yitzchak had two sons, Esav the older, not by much, but the older, and Yaakov, Jacob, the younger. The older one was delegitimized, was considered off, off the path, and the lineage carries on through Jacob. Now Jacob has had ten sons and then a younger son, a younger two sons. And all of a sudden, this younger son is trying to turn us into an Esau, trying to turn us into a Yishmael. He's telling our father reports about us which were actually mistaken reports. He viewed it a certain way, 
but he had, a, he had a mistaken view on it. He's trying to delegitimize us. He's trying to exclude us. He's trying to turn us into an Asa, into a Yeshua. He's trying to kill us in the spiritual sense. And therefore they said, we've got to remove him from the scene, which they do. Now, are they the ones who sold him? Actually, from the, from, from the Psukim itself, it's not so clear. Rashi learns clearly that they're the ones who sold him. Rashbam is very fascinating. The Rashbam is one of the classic commentators. And he really sticks to the pshat, to the actual wording of the verses without bringing in Midrashim. And he gives, in the beginning of this parsha, he gives a whole introduction to, to how, what he does and how he does it. And then he writes, and I discussed this with my mother's father. Happens to be Rashi. He was Rashi's grandson. Right? I discussed with my mother's father how, how, how there's so much more in the pshat and the simple meaning without going on to the medrash. And my mother's father said to me, my mother's father, my teacher, my mentor, my illuminator, etc., 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 said to me that if he had more time, he would go back and write a parish, another explanation that, takes, that, that gives more credence to the actual words without bringing in the medrash without bringing in all of those um, midrashic elements as much. Okay, but so whoever sold him, they certainly set up the sale, and then, tragically, what happens? <laughs> right? Now, they thought, let's go to page 206. 206, 207. They thought by removing Joseph, now the father would no longer have that special connection to Joseph more than they, and now their relationship with their father might be able to improve. What do they do? Vayikhu. Someone take for us. Um, take for us. Yes, please. Beautiful. Let's take a string in English. From 31 on page 207. Someone take for us in English, please. They took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a goat woman, and dipped the tunic in the blood. They dispatched the fine woolen tunic, and they brought it to their father and said, we found this. Identify, if you please, is it your son's tunic or not? He recognized it, and he said, my son's tunic, a savage beast devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to bits. Continue then, on. Then Jacob rent his garments and placed sackcloth on his loins, and he mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all of his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to comfort himself and said, for I will go down to the grave mourning for my son. And his father bewailed him. Okay. So a couple of things here. We've mentioned before that Yaakov had deceived his father with the brachot, with the goat that was brought. And now he's being deceived by his sons about his other son once again with the blood of a goat. Now what happened over here is Yaakov locks in the love that he had for Yosef at that point is locked in. And he is not comforted. He will not be comforted. So what the brothers had hoped that by removing Joseph from the scene would would, would, would alter the family dynamic. On the contrary, it froze in place. It's set in stone. That love that, that he had for Yosef, that cannot be touched. Now, pretty soon, on page 212, we're going to go back to Yosef being brought down to Mitzrayim. But we interrupt that with this whole story of Judah. Okay? So basically, our parsha deals with 
Yosef going down to Mitzrayim, and on page 208, Judah going down. Rashi brings the Medrash that we brought, we interrupt Joseph's going down with Judah's going down because Judah was somewhat at fault, was held responsible by the brothers. Judah was the leader. And they said, you're the one who said, let's not kill him, let's, l- 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 instead of killing him, let's sell him. And we listened to you. Look at the anguish of our father. Had you said, bring him back home, we would have listened to you also. So they said, Judah, you're the leader. We would have listened to you, and we're holding you responsible. Judah leaves. And we have this whole bizarre story <coughs> with Judah. Judah going off, marrying giving birth to three children, Er, Onan, and Shelah. And then Judah takes a wife for his firstborn heir, whose her name was Tamar. Okay? Er does not want Tamar to be, according to the, 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 the marriage Rashi brings, he did not want Tamar to become pregnant, it would ruin her beauty, and he dies. Now, there's a concept called yibum, the leveret marriage, which is if someone marries, now we, we still have that din of the Torah, that if a, if a man dies leaving a wife without any children, then she must either, we don't do yibum, she must either marry yibum, the brother, or have a ceremony called chalitza, which separates. But the idea is that we can give spiritual continuity to the deceased by his wife having a child from his brother, whoever it is, being married to the brother. So Tamar then was wed to Onan. Onan did the same problem. He would waste the seed, as it says in verse 9, and he died. Judah said to Tamar, remain a widow until my son Shelah grows up. <coughs> and the commentators, Rashi Ramban, disagree. Was he actually planning on having her marry? Him having her marry her, his youngest son at the end or not? Whatever the case is, Tamar realizes that it's not happening, at least not at the time that she expects it to happen. So what happened? On page 211, 210, Tamar wants to be part of this family. She removed her widow's garb from upon her, verse 14 to 11, cut herself with a veil, wrapped herself up, sat by the crossroads on the road to Timnah, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot since she had covered her face. He detoured to her by the road and said, consort with you, right? He did not know who she was. What will you give me? He said, I will send you a goat of the kids from the flock. She said, fair enough, but leave a pledge. What pledge? She said, your signet, that's the ring, your, your cloak and the staff in your hand. He gave him to her, consorted with her, she conceived, then she arose, left, and put back on her widow's garb. Now, she is still in mourning. She's still wearing her widow's garb. We're talking about years and years and years. Judah sent the kid of the goats to his friend to retrieve the pledge from the woman. He did not find her. He inquired the people of a place, where is the prostitute, the one that crossed by the road? There is no prostitute here. He came back to Judah, I did not find her. Even the local men said there was no prostitute here. Judah said, let her keep them, lest we become a laughing stock. I sent her this kid, but you could not find her. So, here we go again with the goat. Right? So Yaakov deceived Yitzchak. Yehuda <coughs> deceived Yaakov. Tamar deceives Yehuda, right? Certain things, once we unleash it, 
you can't put the genie back in the bottle, as they say. Right? It just reverberates, reverberates through time. This side, is... And the other side, this is the Yerida. This is Yehuda, who was the leader. He is going down, down, down. And then... Page 213. Someone take for us in English, please. The top. Okay. And it was when, um, when about three months had passed that Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar has committed a harlotry, and moreover, she has conceived by harlotry. Judah said, take her out and let her be burned. And as she was taken out, she sent word to her father-in-law, saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Identify, if you please, whose are this, are this signet, this wrap, and this staff. Okay. So the Gemara, the Talmud, derives from here that it's better to be thrown into a furnace than to humiliate another person. She was not going to say it was you. She was not going to say it was you. Better to be thrown into a furnace than to humiliate another person, even when this other person is the one who actually precipitated this whole humiliation. Nevertheless, Judah recognized, continue, and he said, uh-huh. Judah recognized and he said, She is right, it is for me, inasmuch as I did not give her to, to Shelah, my son. And he was not intimate with her anymore. Good. Continue on, and it came to pass. And it came to pass at that time she gave birth that, that behold, uh, there were twins in her womb. And it happened that as she gave birth, one put out a hand. The midwife took a uh, crimson thread and tied it on the hand, saying, this one emerged first. And it was as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother emerged. And she said, with what strength you asserted yourself. And he called his, his name Paris. Afterwards, the brother on whose hand was the crimson thread came out, and he called his name Sarah. Okay. And then we go back on, and Joseph brought down to Egypt. We continue on with Joseph. Judah was at the point of oblivion. He was about to go off the cliff over here. He could have stood up to the brothers and saved Joseph. He didn't. He's the one who deceived his father. Right? He's the one who said to his father, recognize please, identify if you please, right? Is this the katonet of your son or not? And if we caught on verse 25, that's the exact same words that Tamar used for him. She said, Ha Kerna, recognize, identify if you please, whose signet ring, wrap, and staff this is. So the same exact words that Judah had used to his father when he deceived him, recognize now, please, is this the code of your son? he hears those words ringing in his ears, meaning this is his moment of truth. Will he take that mistake that he made, which caused him to move away, which caused him to marry, which caused him to have children far away, and now it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and Judah is in danger. Judah, the, the whole royalty of Klai Yisrael, of the, the Israelite kingdom, comes from David, which comes from Judah. All of this is in danger right now. And what does he do? He steps forward. And he says, Tzadka, she is righteous. Mimeni. Right? She is more righteous than I, or she is righteous, it is from me, or a heavenly voice came out and said, Mimani, it is from the heavens, whatever the case is. 
Yehuda had ways of doing this without being 100% truthful and humiliating himself. He could have simply said, he could have recognized it, and he could have simply said, in light of the new evidence that has been produced, we're not going to go ahead with this capital punishment, and we're going to try to ascertain who is the true owner of these items, and then lose the items. Whatever the case is, he could have saved her without coming forward, but he didn't. Yehuda came forward, and out from this union, out from this union of Yehuda and Tamar came Peretz and Zarach. Came these two children, out from whom comes the whole dynasty of David, out from whom, take a look on page 12, 73. 1273 is the very end of Megillat root. Ruth, we know Ruth was married to Boaz. And let's hear, let's look on verse 18. Now these are the generations of Peretz. Who's Peretz? Right, Tamar and Yehuda's son. Peretz gave birth to Chetron. Chetron gave birth to Ram. Ram gave birth to Aminadav. Aminadav gave birth to Nachshon. Nachshon gave birth to Salma. Salman gave birth to Boaz. Boaz gave birth to Ove. That's what we just had above. When Ruth married Boaz and, and, and Ove was born. Ove gave birth to Yishai, Jesse, and Yishai gave birth to David. So out from this point where Judah was about to go off the deep end, he turned it around. He turned it around, and from that incident comes Mashiach. And a couple of weeks ago, we spent time how all the, the, the birth of the Messiah comes from the, the most unbelievable and almost... Um, Yeah, um, conspirational, but even more, more than that, you know, really flirting with, with uh, impropriety situations because we explained that Mashiach is the one who's going to, you know, you have to be there to turn things around. He's the one who's going to turn the world around from its sordid state right, into the Messianic age. What was Judah's tremendous, tremendous challenge? What would he want to do at this point? We're going to see how the Yerida, the descent of Yehuda, is the exact opposite of the challenge that, that Joseph is going to have in a moment. And these are the two basic challenges that we are faced with in life, the two categories of challenges that we are faced with, and that is why royalty is coming from Yosef and coming from Judah, because the job of the king is to guide the nation in these two aspects. What did Judah want to do over here? What was he, he was tempted to do what when she presented those things? He could deny. deny. Nothing at all. He doesn't have to deny. She didn't say it was you. If she says it was you, he denies. She says, whoever these belong to, that's who it is. His temptation was not to say a word. What did Judah instead do? He stopped the cycle. He stopped the cycle. He, stuck, he stepped forward. He acted. When he wanted to be quiet and not do anything at all, he acted. 
That is the, the MO of the tribe of Judah. Where else do we find stepping forward from the tribe of Judah? Oh, when they Perez did. with the Midianite women took the spear and... Was that Judah? Uh, that was... Uh, that was Pinchas. That was Pinchas. Not from the tribe of Judah. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking Exodus time. Yamsuf, right? Nachshon ben Aminadav, right? Was, the, was from, from Judah. What did he do? He moved forward into the sea that precipitated then the splitting of the sea, right? That is the, this, this peretz, this, this breaking forward. When you want to, I'm just not going to do anything at all. I'm just going to stay quiet. I'm not going to, right? That's when you need to have that strength to go forward. What happens? So our parsha is the sale of Joseph, and we have Judah's challenge, and we now we're going to have Joseph's challenge. Let's see what Joseph's challenge is. The bottom 213, Joseph brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, a courtier of Pharaoh, the chamber of the butchers, a prominent Egyptian, purchased him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Hashem was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, remained in the house of his Egyptian master. His master perceived that Hashem was with him. Whatever he did, Hashem made success, succeed in his hand. We call it like the Midas touch. Right? Everything he did was beautiful. Joseph found favor in his eyes. He attended and appointed him over his house, or so whatever he had, he placed in his custody. And it happened, from the time he appointed him in his house, over whatever he had, Hashem blessed the Egyptian's house on Joseph's account. So that Hashem's blessing was in whatever he owned, in the house, in the field. He left all that he had in Joseph's custody, and with him present, he concerned himself with nothing except for the bread that he would eat. Even, either, either literally that means the bread he would eat, or, or speaking euphemistically, and it means his wife, right? That, that Joseph had full reign of the house, except he drew the line, right, when it came to Potiphar's wife. After these, and it happened from time pointed, oh, I'm sorry. Now Joseph was handsome of form and handsome of appearance. Which means that at this point, it was starting to go to Joseph's head somewhat. After these things, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. He adamantly refused. He said to his master, I've looked with here, my master concerns himself and nothing in the house. Whatever he has, he has placed in my custody. There's no one greater in the house than I. He has denied me nothing but you, since you are his wife. How can I perpetrate this great evil and have sinned against God? And so it was. Just as she coaxed Joseph day after day, so he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, to be with her. Then there was an opportune day when he entered the house to do his work. No man of the household staff being there in the house. And some say that he went there to do his work, meaning his, his proper chores. Others say that he himself went there planning to succumb to her coaxings, to her seductions. That she caught hold of him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and went outside. What was Joseph's challenge over here? What was Joseph's challenge? He's there in the house. She's with him. Right? What was the voice, in, the voice inside of, of Yehuda was telling him? Stay quiet. Stay quiet. Stay quiet. Just go along with things. Just go along with things. Just go along with it. Right? Don't make. Don't do anything spectacular. Just go along with it. That was jo that was Yehuda's challenge. The voice was saying, "Just go along." And what did he need to do? He needed to stop what was happening. What's What's Yosef's voice telling him to do? Just go along. Yeah. Just go along. Just go along. And what did he need to do? 
right? He needed to act, right? But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and went outside. Again, by Judah, by Yehuda, Yehuda needed, Yehuda, right? It was meant to be quiet, and he said, no, I can't do that. And he, and he reacted. Yosef, Yosef needed this incredible control to not go along with what was being presented to him. Yosef needed to burst. Just one second. Yehuda needed to act. Joseph needed to not act. Yehuda needed to act and say, it was me. You, Joseph needed to not act. Those are the two Yeridos that we have over here, the two, the two temptations, the two challenges that come our way. Sometimes the challenge is to act. Sometimes the challenge is to not act. Who came out? Who came out from this? Well, it's interesting. Yosef was the son of Rachel. What was her big challenge? What would you say was Rachel's greatest challenge? <clears throat> Staying silent. Not act. At which point was that? The marriage. The marriage of her sister to yeah. her husband. She needed to not act. Who came out from Rachel? Who came out from Rachel was Yosef, who didn't act. Who else comes out from Rachel? The tribe of Binyamin, right? Who comes out? Let's go back to the very back again over here, right? Who was the descendant from the tribe of Binyamin? Mordechai and Esther. What was Esther's ability? Hmm? Well, oh, yes, but not. Well, it's one second, right? Page 1254, right? Esther is brought into the palace, right? And they want to know who she is, where is she from, mm -hmm. right? But if we're going to spill the beans too early, then she's not going to be that potent force later on. What is it saying in verse 10 of page 1254? Lo higida Esther et ama vet tziva aleha asher lo tagid. Esther had not told of her people or of her kindred, for Mordechai had instructed her not to tell. The ability, the, the koach of Rachel and that lineage is to hold back. To hold back when we need to hold back. The ability of Yehuda is to act when you need to act. Yaakov wanted Leshev B'Shalva, but that's not what this world is about. This world is about the challenges that we have, and we always have challenges. Right? Mesilat Yesharim says there's the, there's the, we're surrounded by the challenges. There's the war in front of us, the war behind us. There's always, always the challenges. I, I had the opportunity to speak at uh, at, at TVT yesterday. They have, they, they, have a, they have something called God Talk where they bring in different people to present their view or their denomination's view on different things about, about God. And so one of the questions was, you know, what's the Jewish view of, uh, on free will? All right? So we always have free will. Not over what happens, we, we have very little free will over many things, but we always have free will over how we are going to react to any given situation, right? That's Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, 
That's the, the freedom that can never be taken away from a person is how are they going to react? How are we going to react to a situation? We don't control what comes our way. Right? We like to say, you know, the, 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 the cards are dealt to us, but we decide how we're going to play the hand. So the challenges are always coming at us. And the two challenges that we have are epitomized by these two Yeridot, these two descents. The descents of Judah, of Yehuda, and his challenge, and the descent of Joseph being brought down to Egypt, and his challenge. And there are times when we need to act, even though the voice is telling us, be quiet, there are times that we want, where the challenge is to hold back and not act and not partake. And that is the challenges, that is the, cat, the two categories of challenges that we have in life throughout. One last interesting, interesting point here I want to touch on. Like I said, there's just so much here, it's hard to decide what to and what not to. On page 212, we, we, we finished the, the, the whole Yehuda story. We went back to Yosef being brought down to Mitzrayim. Rashi there says, those who can follow in Rashi, I don't know if the English gives it to us. Rashi says, we go back to Onion Rishon, but we, Hifsik, Lismoch, in order to bring close Yeridatosha Yehuda, the, the descent of Yehuda to the sale of Joseph, Lord, I have to tell you that because of him, because of, of that sale, Horidu, Yehuda was brought down from his important position. The ode. Furthermore, Kide Lismoch Masa Ishosha Potifar Lamase Tamar. We wanted to have the story of Tamar and her seduction of Yehuda next to the story of the wife of Potiphar and her attempted seduction of Yosef. Why? Lomer l'cha to teach you mazol l'shem shemayim avzol l'shem shemayim. They both were l'shem shemayim. They both had the purest of intentions. Meaning what? Tamar we understand. Tamar we understand. That was pure of intentions. Because she was supposed to be married to the family of Judah. Once the Torah was given, this Yibum marriages is only to siblings. However, but the concept of Yibum applies throughout. She wanted to be part of the family of Judah. So I understand she was a Shem Shemayim. She had, had pure intention for the sake of heaven. How is Tamar? She saw through her astrology. Children were going to come out from her and Joseph. And it's true. Children did come out from her and Joseph. What she didn't realize is it was her daughter, Asnat, who ended up marrying Joseph. So what she saw was true. There would be progeny between her and Joseph. So the question then, if they both started off with the best of intentions, how is it that Tamar is the mother of David, great, 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 great grandmother of David, the mother of Mashiach? The Messiah is going to come from Tamar. And Potiphar's wife is scorned. She is rejected. She is, she is the one. She is absolutely scorned and rejected. They both started off with the best of intentions. Potiphar's wife did not. We just saw the Rashi said that they did. She saw, she knew that out from her and Joseph were going to come children. Therefore, she wanted to bring that about. That's the Rashi that we just saw. 
They started off with the purest of intentions. So how come we exalt Tamar and the wife of Potiphar is rejected and scorned? Maybe sometimes when we have, we think we have the best of intentions, but you have to go about it in, a, in the right way. So whereas Potiphar was married, she, that was not Tamar, Tamar in a sense, I mean, there was Okay. Okay, so good. So, <clears throat> Tamar was perfectly, halakhically, legally, morally allowed to be with Judah. And the wife of Potiphar, as in the wife of Potiphar, was the wife of another man. She was not. So with the best of intentions, right, it was not allowed along the way. So you have these great holy intentions. You can't, you can't trample along the way. Good. If she would have had a child with Joseph, it would have been a, a mamzel, right? Um, she's married. Um, inter- uh, Halakhli, it's unclear in terms of a non... With the ma- probably. Uh, probably. Probably. I think it's what Sholem Shodron, though, takes it a step further. Right? What's the expression, right? The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. We all start off with good intentions. Right? We're all good people. We all want to do good things. Invariably, we start off with the best of intentions. And invariably, things don't go so smoothly. Things don't always go so easily. When there are challenges, when there are hardships along the way, how do we react? It didn't go well for you, for, 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 for Tamar. She's being taken out to be burned. Capital punishment. She's about to be executed. It's not going her way. The L'shem Shamayim is not working. What does she do? She doesn't say it was you. She doesn't try to destroy the others around her because it didn't go the way that she wanted. I start off the Shem Shamayim. Things are going awry. I'm not going to destroy others around me because my Shem Shamayim, my pure intent for heaven, didn't go the way that it pla- that I planned. That's why she is exalted. It didn't go the way it was planned for Potiphar, right? What happened over there, right? She saw, right? He ran out. <laughs> it didn't go the way she wanted. 2.17, verse 13, when she says he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called out to the house and spoke to him saying, look, he brought us a Hebrew man to spore with us. He came to lie with me. But I called out with a loud scream. And when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment behind me and fled and went outside. She kept his garment aside until the master came home. She told him this a similar account saying, the Hebrew slave whom you brought us came to sport with me. But I raised my voice and screamed. He left his garment beside me and he ran out. And it was when the master heard his wife's words, she spoke saying, your slave did these things to me. His anger flared up. Then Joseph's master took him and placed him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined and he remained there in prison. Started off the shame shamayim. Started off with good intentions. It didn't go the way that she had hoped it would go. What was her reaction? So Destroy. <laughs> Destroy all those around me. Destroy the one who didn't follow the the the. Yeah, in the play, what's it called? Not the script. The script, thank you. Right? He didn't follow this. I planned everything the Shem Shemayim. I had it all worked out. How dare you not follow the script? And that's why she brings him down. That's why she is rejected. She is scorned. It's easy to start off with great intentions. But invariably, 
there's not going to be smooth sailing. All right? So with great intentions, like Natalie said, we can't be doing wrong things along the way to get there. And when things don't go our way, then we have to say, okay, we have to keep our focus and say, I wanted to do the right thing. It's not going, it's not going to go. That doesn't give me license then to destroy others along the way. So we have, we have, Yos, we have Yaakov wanting to sit peacefully. And we see, like Linda had said, life doesn't allow for, that's not what life is about. Life is about constant challenges, decisions, growth. The basic categories of challenges is to act when we're meant to act in the Judah mode, to not act when we're not, act, we're not meant to act in the Rachel Joseph mode. And as we're doing our good things and trying to do our good things, right, the end doesn't justify the means. And when things are not going exactly the way that we had choreographed, that we had imagined, then we can't lose our focus and we have to stay true to our course of L'Shem Shamayim. And as situations change, then the way that the L'Shem Shamayim will manifest itself also needs to change. And it can't be that this is how it has to be. It's got to be, you know, my way or the highway, and it's not going that way, and therefore, right, all heck breaks loose for all those around us. Okay, my friends, we'll call Thank it over you. here. Thank you, Brana. Thank you, Brana. <coughs> how are you, Brana? How are you, Brana? It's Rabbi Sinner.